That's it for the announcements. We hope you enjoy the message. Well, good morning. Welcome here. No? <laughs> Welcome here. It's good to see you. Uh, before we start, why don't you stand up with me and we'll present this to God, okay? Father, we come and we want to say thank you that, that we get to come before you, the King of Kings, the, the, the one whose name is higher, the one whose name is greater. And we want to just say thank you that we can come to you and approach you and see you. And so, God, this morning we ask, or we, we just simply say, we want to make ourselves open to you, and we ask that you, we would have the honor of seeing you and hearing you speak this morning. We want to see you, Father. We want to hear you speak. We want to see you be God in our lives. And so we present ourselves and we say, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've been here for a while or if you've been following us for the last little while, you know that we are in the I Am series, uh, the series of statements that uh, Jesus was making about who he is and who he wants to be in our lives. And you will also know that a lot of these statements that Jesus makes go back in history to when the Israelites were living in Egypt and that whole transition of moving from Egypt into the promised land, which is, was called back then Canaan. Today it's called Israel. You know that the I Am statements correspond to a lot of that. You heard Claude talk about the manna that the Israelites received in the desert, the food that dropped down from heaven or just simply appeared and then vanished when the sun came up. Uh, the Israelites were looking for that. And Jesus says, well, if, if you're empty or if you're hungry... I am the bread of life. I will make you full. So if you're hungry, we heard Claude talking about this. If you're hungry, chew on Jesus and he will get a full stomach. Then we also heard Brenton following that. We heard Brenton talking about uh, if you are not sure where you're going, if we don't know the way or if we, don't, if we can't see, we heard Brenton talking and saying, well, Jesus is the light. And so if we are living in darkness, Jesus offers light. And that corresponds to the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that the Israelites saw when they were walking through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. Today we want to take another look at, or we want to take a look at another aspect of Jesus' I am statements. It's the I am the gate or the gateway statement. And it corresponds to that, that whole process of, or the whole thought that the Israelites were in a place of bondage. And there was another place called the promised land. And Jesus presented, God presented an opportunity or a way to get from one place to another. So that's what we want to look at today. And to do that, we want to look at the context. What prompted this whole conversation? What what was the context? Why did Jesus make this claim? Where did it come from? So what we'll do is we'll take a look at John chapter 9, which sets up the context. And then out of the context, we'll go into John chapter 10, where Jesus makes the I am the door, or I'm the gateway claims. John chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi... Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In verse 6, after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud, took the mud, puts it on the man's eyes. Now go to the pool and wash yourself. And so the man goes and does that, and his eyes are opened. Now this creates quite a scene. The neighbors don't understand it. His family doesn't understand it. The people who know him don't understand it. And they, 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 what's happening here is basically what they're saying. And they can't, they can't grasp it. This man was born blind, 
And now he's seeing that's an impossibility. And so they bring the man to the Pharisees, because this just this doesn't make sense. So they bring the man to the Pharisees, who test him, who question and investigate the matter. And this con- story continues in verse 16. The, the Pharisees say, This man is not from God for what he does, for he does not keep the Sabbath. In other words, the problem was, here is an impossibility that has just happened, but this can't be from God because making mud on the Sabbath is wrong. It's a sin. That was according to the Pharisees. Can't do that. So this man can't be from God because he sinned. He obviously didn't keep the holy day separate. But others are saying, of the, others of the Pharisees are saying, but there's an impossibility here that happened. Only God can do that. Sinners can't do that. And so they're, they're confused and they're like, how, how does this work? And so they're questioning this whole story. It, they ask the man then in verse 17, what do you think? Like, this happened to you. Like, who do you think he is? And the man just says, well, he's a prophet. For the man, there's no doubt about it. He's a prophet. There's some more conversation that happens between verse 17 and verse 24. And verse 24, we pick it up again. But the Pharisees don't believe it. They, they don't, in their mind, it does not work that a sinner who does not keep the Sabbath can perform a miracle that can only come from God. Like, it just doesn't compute. The world, the, those two worlds don't fit into their brain. So they're, they're, they're confounded by this. And so they turn to the man and they say, give glory to God by telling the truth. In other words, you didn't tell the full story before. Tell us what really happened. Be truthful. Tell us what happened. We know... This man is a sinner. Conversations happens a little bit further, and then in, in verse 28, we pick it up again. And now the Pharisees are already quite, quite upset. You are this fellow's disciple. And by the way, this fellow is Jesus, whom they think is a sinner. Okay? You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. In other words, we're on the right track. We have Moses. We know God spoke to him. We're following Moses. We are on the right track. But this guy, we don't even know where he comes from. But the man can't deny his experience. I mean, he was born blind, had never been able to see. And now some guy comes up to him, makes some mud, puts it on his eyes, and now he can see. He can't deny that. That's an impossibility. And the man is not about to deny his experience. So he says something that really riles the Pharisees. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from. Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does as well. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. It's an impossibility. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That's what the blind, now sightful man says. And the Pharisees have had enough. We are the way. And so they, they retort, instead of, Instead of saying, okay, am I missing something? They throw him out. You're the problem. Jesus was the problem. Now you're the problem. So we kick you out. That sounds somewhat like sometimes what we go through, right? I'm never wrong, right? Anyway, anyway so that's a side note. <laughs> Jesus searches the man after that. The man says, like, can you tell me like, who this really is? And Jesus says, well, the son of man, that's me. That's what Jesus says to the man. And the man right there, in view of the Pharisees watching, worships Jesus. And that's the context for Jesus then making the claims in chapter 10. Jesus making the claims. So let's read that here, okay? <clears throat> 
Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out, uh, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they do. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. But the Pharisees don't know what's like. Like Jesus, can you speak English, please? What 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 are you saying? We don't, we don't get it. So in verse 7, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. When we were talking about this passage or this whole series of the the I Am series, the I Am statements that Jesus made, um, somehow this one was thrown into my lap. And I read it and I said, what am I going to say here? Like, like, what does this even mean? What does it mean when Jesus says he's the gate? Or what does it mean that he's the gateway? What does the gate lead to? Who are the thieves and the robbers? What do they steal, kill, and destroy? What, what is life to the fullest? So those, those were some questions that I had. And so I started just digging to this, re, reading this over and over, just reading this and looking at some, some other authors as to what their thoughts were on this. And, and I found that, uh, that when Jesus says he's the gate, uh, the concept of a gate just simply, it, it is just simply means it's, it's the way to get through a barrier from one place to another. Like we have doors back there and on the side. How do we get from one place to another as we go through a door or a doorway? And in this context, and you know Jesus already well enough, that Jesus usually has more than one meaning when he says something. Just like he said, like he's the bread of life. Like people were offended. Like I'm going to chew your meat, your flesh. And he said, no, no, no. Like we're talking spiritual language here. It's the same concept here. When Jesus says he's the door, I'm not going to bulldoze right through the physical Jesus, but he's the point or he's the, he's the one who broke the barrier to get from one place to another. In other words, there's one place, and if you, if you go back to Israel's history, they were in one place of bondage, and they wanted to get out of that place to another place that was better, the promised land. But in between them, between these two places, there's a barrier, something that we can't get through. And Jesus says, he's the one who opens up a way so that you can get through. There's a gateway to get through. So that's the first concept. And Jesus is saying to these Pharisees who are saying, the Pharisees are essentially saying, they are the way to get through from one place to another. Jesus says, no, you're not. I am the way. You are not the way. You're not the door. I am the door. I am the gate. That's what Jesus is saying in this context. So where does this gate lead to? What's behind the gate? What's on the other side? Pasture is always greener on the other side, right? Promised land is on the other side. The promised land for the Jews of the time, Jesus had to explain this a little bit because for the Jews, they they were looking for the Messiah because they had thought they had left the place of bondage 
And they had arrived in Canaan, which is today modern-day Israel. They arrived there, and they thought this was their promised land. But the problem was, the promised land was under oppression. The Romans were there. The Romans were putting pressure on them, drawing taxes, sucking them dry. And so the Israelites thought that we are in the promised land, but we're not in the promised land. You know what I mean? We're in Canaan, but it's not a place of freedom. It's a place of bondage. And so that's why they were looking so much for the Messiah. But the gate that Jesus refers to, and we see this in the statement, whoever enters in through me will be saved. That word saved... Jesus says he's the gate to a couple of things. One of which is he's the gate to eternal promised land, to heaven. We call it heaven. And he's saying, Jesus is saying, if you want to move from one place to another place, to heaven, the gate the one who broke that barrier and made a way so, so that we could get from one place to another, that gate is Jesus. And this gate leads to eternal life. That's one meaning of the word saved. There's a second uh, word, meaning of that word, which it, that, that word can be translated a different way. It can be translated, whoever enters in through me will be kept safe which has an eternal safety, but it also has the meaning that we can be kept safe here, today, in this world. We can enter the promised land today. We don't have to wait till we die to enter the promised land. There's a promised land that Jesus is offering us today. We can enter that promised land today. And <clears throat> we see this all over the scriptures as well. Proverbs, for example, talks about this. Proverbs 1, 32 to 33. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them. The complacency of fools will destroy them. We've, we just heard those words, kill and destroy, right? Thieves come in to steal, kill, and destroy. Verse 33, but whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. This, we're not just talking about eternity here. We're talking about today. Freedom from harm. <clears throat> Freedom from fear. Proverbs 2, 10 to 11. Similar. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Look at this. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. So Jesus is saying, do you want to be saved for eternity? I am the gate. Do you want to enter the promised land in this world? I am the gate. And the gate is available for everybody to enter the promised land today. And again, I just want to make sure that we understand I'm not talking about a health and wealth gospel. I'm not talking that we will be, whatever we do, nothing will challenge us. I'll get to that in a, in a couple of minutes. We will face challenges. But what, what this is saying is we're talking about living in such a way that our energy and that our actions, our efforts, our lives are not wasted and futile. We're talking about living in such a way that when I do something, it produces fruit. We can actually move forward. We can actually leave this place of bondage, whatever that is for us, we can leave that and walk out into freedom. That's what this is talking about. And it's not just for, for, like, for the future. It is for the future, absolutely. Absolutely but it is for today as well. This, this opportunity to live in the promised land. And Jesus says, you want to live in the promised land today? You want freedom today? You want safety today? 
I am the gate. There is no other gate. Did, have you ever noticed how desperately we as a human race search for eternal safety and for better lives here on earth? Have you, have you ever noticed that? I mean, the world is full of gates. Full. There's lots and lots of gates to choose from that promise all sorts of things. Um, one, one, one that I found quite interesting was um, Ponce de Leon was a conquistador who traveled with Christopher Columbus when the Americas were discovered. And legend has it, and history shows it, that actually he was searching for the fountain of youth. And he found it in Florida. So if you guys go to Florida, please bring me some fountain of youth water, okay? Legend has it that he found it in Florida. It's actually still in Florida today, in Punta Gorda, Florida. That's where that fountain. You can still go there today and get this water from the fountain of youth. Did you know that that fountain was so popular not that many years ago that fountain was so popular that you had thousands and thousands of people lining up to this fountain. And they had, they had put a tap on this fountain, like a handle to control how it flowed. Because it wasn't a huge stream. It was just a small fountain coming out. They had put a tap on it. And there were so many people who went to this fountain that they had to replace the, the tap every six months because it was just shot from using Every six months, the tap was shot and they had to replace it. That fountain, by the way, does not work and people are starting to figure it out because if you go there today, uh, you actually have to search to find it because it's, it's still there, but it's basically nobody goes there anymore. And Ponche de, Leon, Ponche de Leon is not here today, so it doesn't work, right? But people try that. Thousands upon thousands of people try that. Uh, another thing that's happening lately in science is you might have heard about this um, cryonics where they take a body of somebody who says, I want to live forever. And they take a body and they flash freeze it from whatever room temperature down to minus 169 degrees Celsius, generally speaking. Flash freeze it in the hope that they think that technology will catch up and they'll be able to scan the brain and all the memories and all the feelings and all the perspectives and all the whatever, and they'll be able to scan the brain, take that, put it into another body, and now this person will live on again. And there's actually literally hundreds and hundreds of people who are right now in that state. They're in a frozen state right now. Why? They're looking for the eternal promised land. And we could go on on that. Why are there so many religions? It's because we're all looking for the promised land. And we're not only looking for the promised land in eternity, like Ponce de Leon and like this uh, cryonics idea or or all these religions, we're also looking for the promised land here today. And so you have today, we have a pile of doors that offer to take us from where we currently are into the promised land. And we even do it under the name of faith. So we, we say things like, and I've heard this, and I have to guard myself against this, we've heard things like, if I had Jesus and more money, I would live a better life. Now, all of a sudden, I have put money as a door to a better life. Do you see that? Or, or we say things like, if only I could move the weight from here to here. I don't like my body. If only I had a better body, then I would have a better life. Would I? I don't think so. And this is what Jesus is, is claiming here, is, is saying, he's saying very, very clearly, 
If you want to enter the promised land, I am the gate, period. Nobody else, nothing else, one gate, one person who broke that barrier that separated us from our bondage and that gives us access to safety and eternal life. One gate, and Jesus is it. We, we pursue this further. Why, why does North America have such a rampant, rampant uh, sexual problem? Because we think, as a society, we think that sexuality will give us access to or will us lead us to a better life. We think that. That's, otherwise, we wouldn't go through that. We play games with superheroes. And we, we play games with that. Like Movies, superhero movies are so popular. Why? Because if, if I had the ability to fly, well, then I would have a better life. Or if I had the ability to, I don't know what, become invisible, I would have a better life. And we place value on something that cannot give us a better life, but that thing promises us a better life, but it can never actually deliver on it. Aladdin's lamp cannot lead me to a better life. See, one of the things that we do is we define a better life as pleasure. Pleasure and a better life, we equate them and say that's the same thing. And pleasure is based on my feelings. That's simply not true. My feelings or my wishes and my desires will not give me a better life. That's not the promised land. Because if it was, then I could just do more drugs. Right? Or whatever. Or I could try all sorts of... But it's not the promised land. But we try them anyway. And further than that, what does this gate lead to? It leads to eternal safety. It also leads to a promised land here. And there could be a pile of things that could be said about the promised land here. Uh, I, I won't go into all of that. The the gate also leads to freedom. Notice how Jesus treats the man. Not once does he pressure the man to do anything. There is no pressure. Jesus simply comes up to a man who has a prison of some sort. And he just says, hey, do you want to get out of that prison? Do you want to see? Do you want to physically see? Jesus just offers free. Do you want to get, do you want to get, have a gate from your enslavement to a place of freedom? And the man picks it up. And then he's challenged, after he picks it up, he's challenged by the authorities. Oh, that's not proper. We need to push you back down. We need to put you back into place. The Pharisees are trying to push him back into his place, right? That's why they kick him out, because he, he doesn't fit into their mold. And Jesus doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, once the person has been kicked in, Jesus goes back to him and he offers him more freedom. He actually empowers the man even further. Because the man is saying, okay, something doesn't make sense here. This box doesn't work anymore. But there's got to be more. And Jesus simply says, well, you're looking at that man right now. Jesus says he's the son of man. And the man right there in view of the Pharisees, like I said, worships Jesus. Worships. And so this whole concept of the gate leads to freedom is still available for us today. See, we have freedom that comes in all sorts of pressure, all sorts of forms. Pressure to conform. Pressure to try harder. We struggle because we think we're not good enough to enter heaven. So we try harder. 
We struggle because we think we're not smart enough. So we learn more. We struggle because we think we don't have enough physical resources, so we gather more. We struggle to be approved, so we want to hear more people say, I like you, or I love you, or I, whatever it is, like me, check me. I'm a snack. We, we want to hear more and more people say that. <laughs> I learned that from my kids, by the way. <laughs> How much things or how many things do we do because we don't measure up and we think by conforming to the pressures that we'll somehow we'll be able to fit in and we'll find our place. And Jesus says, no, I relieve all that pressure from you. Just simply come to the gate and you will, I will empower you, but I will not control you. I will empower you to be free, which means to choose. I will empower you so that you can choose, but I will not control you. That's what Jesus does. Jesus comes to give us power so that we can live a free life. That's, that's what it, freedom is all about. I uh, could say a lot more about that one, but I'm just going to keep going because the time is clicking, ticking. In this verse, you also say, you also see, they will come in and go and find what they will find pasture. And this, we've already looked a little bit at this. They will find pasture. In other words, they will find provision. God, just like Jesus did for this man, Jesus is awaiting and shows up in our lives and says, hey, I see this spot that you're in and I see that you want to get out. I will create an opportunity for you to get out of that and I will provide that opportunity for you. Jesus shows up and makes that opportunity available to us today. That's the good news. That's the good news is we have this provision. Now, again, I'll just uh, qualify that a little bit. It's not my, the needs according to my perspective. Because my perspective says, I want Jesus plus this. That's what my perspective says. That's what my fallen nature says. Jesus plus. And Jesus says no. Philippians 4.19 my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And we fall, we fall away from this thought because of my thought that I need Jesus plus. Sin, that's what sin is. Sin is missing the mark. See, Jesus says, I want to come and give you a full life. And we think that we can find a full life through this channel, that the, one of the channels that the world offers. And Jesus says, no. You want a full life? There's one gate. There's one gate that leads to a full life. All these others are dead ends. They promise something, we walk through them, and we get disappointed, we get depressed. We get anxiety. We get fear. Because our efforts are on shaky ground. Uh, the fruit is on shaky ground and it can be lost and it will be lost. And so when I was looking through this, uh, when Jesus' statement, I am the gate, leads to eternity as an eternal safety. It leads to a better life here on earth. It leads to freedom, the ability to move in and out the ability to move about, the ability to decide. It leads to his provision. That's what the gate leads to, where he'll, provi where he'll provide. And again, there's lots that could be said about that. But one of the questions I had is, okay, who are the thieves and robbers? Well, the thieves and robbers are simply anything that pretends to give us a better life, or that leave, pretends to leave us or lead us into the promised land, but cannot deliver the promised land. 
That's a thief and a robber. And what do they steal, kill, and destroy? Well, if we look at society again, how many people live in fear? Fear that I won't have enough. Fear that I will be single all my life. Fear that I will never be able to love my spouse again. Fear that I won't have good friendships. Fear that I will not have a good job. Fear that I will not make this class. Fear, 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 fear. Where does that come from? We've walked through doors that cannot deliver the freedom that Jesus offers. And I'm not saying that all of these things are bad. Like, I'm not saying that, that money is bad. I'm just saying we place value on money that money cannot deliver. I'm not saying that singleness or marriage or relationships or likes on Facebook or whatever social media you have, I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying that we place value on something that cannot bring us to a promised land that cannot bring us to a better place. We, we act as if it's Jesus plus something else can give me a full life. And Jesus says, no, no, I can give you a full life. I alone can give you a full life. That's what Jesus is saying in this passage. We see, we see things, freedom being stolen, peace being stolen, contentment being stolen and destroyed hope being destroyed why do i struggle with with anxiety or depression it's because it's being destroyed in me by a thief and a robber and so there's there's lots there that could be said i just wanted to leave it at that we find the same message in romans romans 7 and 8 Romans 7.24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? We are in a state of slavery. That's where we are born. Who will rescue me? And the good news, I heard that whispered, Jesus, he's the gate. He's the gate that says, hey, I see you're in your state. Do you want freedom? That's good news. And we don't have to work for it. We don't have to try for it. We don't have to sweat for it. It's just simply... Hey, I see you're blind. Do you want to see? It's as simple as that. And his name is Jesus. And then in, in verse 25, I get sidetracked from this. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse, chapter 8, verse 1. There is no condemnation, no guilt. It's all wiped away. You're struggling with guilt. Jesus says, hey, I've got a way for you. I've got a portal. I'm making open an opportunity for you to get from one place to another. I'm going to take care of all your guilt. All of it. Free. To wrap up, John 9, or sorry, John 10, verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out. That's freedom. Find pasture. That's provision. I have come. That they may have life and have it to the full. See the word whoever? Let's just listen to these, these familiar verses that you probably read. I don't know how many times. 1 Timothy 
this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved. This, this is an invitation that's open to everybody and anybody. Do you, see, do you see that you're in a prison of some sort? Jesus says, come. I'm offering you hope. I'm offering you a full life. John 3.16 says the same thing. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever, doesn't matter. The, the, the phrase will be saved or will be kept safe. Listen to John 10, 27 to 29. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. No one. Listen to John 8, 34 to 36. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Can't get out, you're trapped. A slave has no permanent place in the family. You're kicked out. But a son, a daughter, belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Hallelujah, I agree. So my question is, <clears throat> as we wrap up, do you feel like you're boxed up? Do you feel like you, you're just tight as if there's a chain around you and it's just tightening and tightening and you've tried all the sorts of things and you can't get free out of it? Or do you doubt that you'll go to heaven? Have we been looking at something to give me passageway to the promised land here on earth and you're finding that it's actually ending up dry and actually it's been a thief and a robber instead that it's actually sucking life out of me instead of giving me life well Jesus invitation is very very clear here it says hey if you see that I want to give you an opportunity, I want to give you a, an access point to get from one place to another. And that access point is available today. It's, it's available. Why don't we stand? <clears throat> Jesus, we come to you and we recognize that so often we so often we, we come to you and we say we want you, but we add a little plus there, plus I want this, plus I want that door. So Jesus, first of all, I want to say sorry that we, that we don't think that you're enough for us. Sorry that we think that we need more than you. As if you didn't quite meet all our needs. So we repent of that, but we also turn to you and say, Jesus, help us in our state of, of imprisonment, wherever that is. Whatever that is, Jesus, open our eyes that we may see like the man that he not only physically saw, but he recognized you as the Savior, as the gate to the promised land. Jesus, we want to live in the promised land here today. We want, to, we want to make sure that our lives are fruitful, that we're not stuck, and we turn to you and say, in your mercy, have, have grace on us. 
And we also say thank you that you are the gate, that you come to us and that you open and you freely open up a way and say, I am the gate. Thank you. We say thank you. We say thank you that you are the gate and that you give us this chance for freedom, for eternal, eternal security. Eternal security in you. And I ask Holy Spirit that by your power you would simply come and you would touch. You know our hearts, you see our hearts. Just come and touch. Minister right now. Open eyes. For your name's sake, Jesus. Amen. day in the Lord. Just stay connected to him today and through your week. If you need prayer this morning, check out the prayer room at the back. Otherwise, we'll see you next weekend. Blessings.